Hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Grant Castor. I am Extemporary's Community Manager, and welcome to this third and final presentation of our PD extravaganza. Uh, today, this Monday, Communicative Language Teaching and Extemporary, what, why, and how. Again, this is part of our 2023 PD extravaganza, and I'm really looking forward to talking with you all about Communicative Language Teaching and Extemporary today. So let's get into it. We're going to start today with basic introduction and some session objectives of what we're going to be doing. First, our PDA extravaganza, if you don't know already, if you're here, you probably know a pretty good deal about it. We have all sorts of workshops and sessions coming up this week. They're all going to be recorded, um, so you can watch them whenever. We encourage you to join during the live times. That way you can get certificates of attendance for potential CEUs. Um, we hope you really enjoy it. There are plenty of sessions on extempore, but also on community language teaching, task-based language teaching, rubrics, um, reflections, a whole bunch, a whole slate of things related to world language teaching. We hope you enjoy it and we'll attend other sessions uh, later this week. What we're going to look at today, a little bit about my background. I'm a former Chinese language teacher and now work with Extempore doing a lot of things like giving sessions on uh, high quality world language teaching. Um, and yeah, let's keep going. So first we're going to talk about what is community of language teaching. And then we're going to get into some of its background and its components. We're going to talk about the why. Why should we take a communicative approach? Some benefits of communicative language teaching. And then finally, how, what, why, and how. How can we use extempore as a tool for communicative language teaching in our classrooms? We'll see plenty of examples as we go with that. And then finally, we'll finish on some resources, some feedback for you to provide me. And of course, some time for some question and answers at the end. Let's get into it. So first off, what is communicative language teaching to you? I ask. First thing I want to do is just talk about it, be really open-ended. Feel free to unmute your microphone, turn on your camera, talk out loud, or just put a message in the chat. When you think of community of language teaching, what comes to your mind? How do you sort of navigate this? Feel free to share. Okay, I'll start. <laughs> um, I think communicative language is just based on what we just do in school, that the students are able to communicate with uh, somebody other than their teacher. So for me, if you guys know me already, one of the things I always talk about is tasks. Yeah, Dora mentioned tasks. There's so many different tasks. How can we use task in the language classroom? All about tasks. Major or just here? Oh no, it's Gisela speaking. Hold on, maybe it's my microphone. Oh my gosh, I was not able to hear. Hold on. Can somebody speak? Yes, hi Grant. Hello. Yes, good, good, thank you. Good, oh, oh my gosh. <laughs> okay, Gisela, would you like to You're gonna call AI, call for AI right now. Oh my gosh, jeez. Gisela, would you like to share again for me? Um, no, <laughs> it's okay. That's okay. Yeah, Callie, thank you. Having a purpose to communicate. Yeah, we're going to talk a lot about purpose today with our language. I may. What else do we think of when we talk about community of language teaching? What do we, what do we think of? As a teacher, we want that the kids communicate with other kids and with people outside if they travel, you know, For like sure. this language, this Spanish. Yeah, mm -hmm. communicating, right? Dora says information gap and role play is awesome. Anybody else? Any other thoughts? Okay, let's keep going. So let's see, let's talk about what's, these sort of experts say on community language teaching. Sandra Savignon, way back from 1987, was one of the biggest proponents of community of language teaching. And she, in her this sort of main sort of opus she had on community language teaching, talked about five key components, which each just correspond to a certain, a different facet of the language learning process. And when she went to define community of language teaching, a lot of it relates to communicative competence, right? How competent are we? How good are we at communicating in the target language, right? So that's where we need to lead our students. 
let's look at these five components that she mentions. The first one is language arts. Now, a bit ironic because we talk about well, using it for communication and not emphasizing grammar and all of those things so much. But at the end of the day, languages, yes, they have rules of usage and we should explain how the language functions. We can teach grammar within moderation, obviously, but it's important that our students know when they go to produce the language or interpret the language, there are rules behind how the language works. Secondly, using language for a purpose. We talked, we saw Callie mention that in the chat. Use the language for a real and immediate communicative purpose. What do we need the language for? What can we do with the target language that we're learning? These last few I really like. The one is my language is me, right? As we go to learn the language, as students get more and more, I guess, sort of closer to it, they build sort of a relationship with it. We have to give our learners respect for learners as they use the second language for self-expression because eventually we'll want to do things with the language that are unique to our own needs, right? I want to learn Japanese so I can read uh, manga and watch anime. I want to learn, I don't know, Chinese so I can communicate about Chinese history or whatever that might be. What are the sort of special needs and, and uh, unique interests that our students are going to want with that language? Continuing, you be, I'll be. You're all very familiar with this role playing, which you call it a natural component of language learning. And then finally, number five, beyond the classroom. For our students, we want our students to eventually use this language to communicate outside of the classroom. How do our communicative goals, how do our classroom lessons reflect and relate to getting our students to eventually use the language outside of the classroom? So I want you to think now when you see these sort of five components that Savignon mentions related to CLT. Which one for you resonates the most? And what about for your current students? Which one do you feel, which one do they, you think they would say is the most important for them? You can feel, share in the chat, you can share out loud, whatever you wanna do. I think for me it would be teaching language for a purpose. Sure. Thanks Gisela. And also be on the classroom. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, those are those are really valuable for myself as well. Anybody else? Well, since uh, Odilia took number, what number is that? The one from the purpose. I think I was going to hint on number four. Yeah. Uh, because with what I teach, students don't really have the opportunity of practicing outside mm -hmm. the classroom. It's true now we have uh, possibility of practicing online. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, it's very important to give them the opportunity to use the language inside the classroom because beyond the classroom, I can't really control that. Number yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Dora. Yeah, I, I like a lot of these responses in the chat too. Number two, I think is really important for students. I think a lot of us are seeing that. Where's the purpose? You know, you have the age old question for school. Why are we doing this? What's the point of this, right? We hear that all the time. Well, we can give them a direct answer to that question with what we do in the classroom. Uh, number five is really great, you know, using the language beyond the classroom. When we can relate it to students' interests, it's really helpful. Uh, Jeannie says, my language is me. Spanish-speaking students want to know why they need to learn a language beyond the requirement, right? We're going to, yeah, we're going to look at that more too. Oftentimes, it's just a graduate, you know, a graduation requirement, but we want more of that. Oh, these are great responses. Thank you all for, for sharing. This is great. All right, let's keep going. One other quote that I, oh, excuse me. One other quote that I really liked from Savignon is this specifically. I'm going to read it because I think it's, it's powerful when we hear the whole thing. What matters with community language teaching is the teacher's understanding of what language learning is and how it happens. The basic principle is that learners should engage with text, comprehensible input, and meaning through the process of use and discovery. We know that. Finally, CLT does not exclude a focus on metalinguistic awareness or knowledge of rules of syntax, discourse, or social appropriateness. We can teach grammar, we can teach all of these things that, you know, just within moderation, right? Focus on form can be a familiar and welcome component in a learning environment that provides rich opportunity for focus and meet on meaning, but focus on form cannot replace practice in communication, right? My own emphasis added is there. It's all about what we're doing, using the language to communicate, right? We can teach form, we can teach grammatical rules, but that can't be the main focus of what we're doing in the classroom. Let's keep going. All right, why? Why then? So we've talked about the what, now the why. Why should we take a communicative approach? What do you all think? Again, please share. And then I'll, I'll share my own, my own reasons coming up. Why should we take a communicative approach in our classrooms? What's the point? Why are we doing this? 
students want to communicate. Who is that? I don't see your, your name coming up. Jason. Jason, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> students want to communicate. <laughs> yes, thankfully, my next, my next slide literally will, will say exactly that. Students want to communicate. More things. Any others? Students um, want to have, oops. No, go oh, ahead. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, students want to have the opportunity of using the language in a spontaneous way. Yeah, using language because, spontaneously. Yeah, you don't go around with notes. It has to be spontaneous. Mm -hmm. um, studying rules of grammar and memorizing long lists of vocabulary is boring. No. It's boring. No. <laughs> and I'm a grammar geek. Trust but me. It, it doesn't lead to communicative <laughs> capabilities. Right, right. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Martha. I think a lot of us, myself included, I love grammar, right? When I get to learn about grammar, I'm like, this is so cool. It's how the language works. Unfortunately, our students don't really care. Most of them really couldn't care, which, you know, is a downside for us, but we have to, we have to adapt to that, right? We can have our little grammar nerd moments every, you know, for 10 minutes, maybe once a week in class when we're sharing something, but we need to help them communicate, right? And that's what's interesting to them is when they can use the language to do something. One more things in the chat. What do we got? Communication. They seem more interested and can apply to real life situations. The end goal is empower our students to be able to communicate in the real world. I think we see a theme here communicate right that is what we want students to do and would you look at that before we get to this sorry i want to add obviously you're attending this presentation here on community of language teaching there is a ton that people have said on community of language teaching there are books and articles and books and books and books on community of language teaching today we are really just scratching the surface so please check out all of the other sources that are around there is much more to this than just this. So that's why I, I preface this with, with these, this, these resources. But yes, right, we'll stick with three main reasons. The first one, what is the purpose of language? Why do students sign up for our courses? They don't sign up for a graduation requirement, though some of them might. They want to communicate in the target language, even though they might be hesitant, right? People sign up for you know Spanish, for Japanese, for German, whatever it might be, they are excited to be able to communicate, to be able to understand target text in that language, right? That's why they sign up. Jason mentioned this right away. They want to communicate. That's why if for, for, for second language, uh, for non-native speakers, for like me, I took my language because I wanted to communicate, right? That's why we do it. That's why we use language to communicate. Do we want our students coming to class ready to conjugate verbs and do grammar? Do we want them ready to come into class to use the actual language. That's the purpose behind it. Yes, a little bit of grammar practice can help, but what is our main focus, right? So with each of these three reasons, I have a couple of examples of how we can sort of make this shift gradually in, this, in, in our classrooms. The first example would be using a communicative task as a summative assessment. What do I mean by that? Here's an example. Based on the weather, your friend schedules and what's available in your local area, propose two activities with reasons, for what you want to do this weekend. That is a task, it's something we do all the time, and it's a summative assessment that we can use as opposed to, you know, match this grammar, fill in the blank here, put the correct verb, put the correct verb in, put the correct adjective, put the noun form in, right? That's not communicative. There's nothing, in some, in some instances, the student doesn't even have to know what the language means in order to do that. It's not meaning-based. We want community of tasks, always thinking about what is our purpose? Why? I remember hearing from you know admins all the time. You know what is your what is your why? What is your why for teaching? Why are you here? Well, what is our why for what we're doing in the classroom? It's important to remember. Let's move on. Number two that I think is important as well is a mindset shift. Think about when we center communication, how this becomes a student's goal, right? When we emphasize less and less on grammar and accurate target language use, again, not to say that we can't, but when that is less of an emphasis, there's less pressure than on our students to produce so-called perfect language or accurate language. They're not worrying all the time, oh, what if I make a mistake in front of Mr. Kastner? He's going to mark off points and everything. We don't want them to do that. When we center communication and using the language for a purpose to complete a task, that becomes their student's goal, and they're less anxious and concerned about grammar. Right. With this, one of these benefits is that there's more willingness for them to experiment and using the language to communicate. Right. And that's what we want. We keep talking about communication. 
An example that I like a lot is warm-ups. So you might give it a warm-up of a basic grammar test, but we don't want to do it. We want something communicative, right? Tempo, who is the unofficial name of our extemporary mascot, as I like to call him, uh, hasn't really caught on around here yet. That's okay. Wants to know your most fit, the most popular classes at your school. Post on Padlet three of your favorite classes this year with reasons why you like them. Comment on other posts saying if you agree or disagree. Right. So that's a task. That's something that students can do in the classroom, opening up the, the lesson and say, hey, use what we know so far and tell us what, your mo what the most popular classes are at your school and post on Padlet. Notice here that warm up. No linguistic requirement. There's nothing saying, hey, you need to use three present tense verbs. You need to correctly match four adjectives with four different nouns. None of that. It's just a task. Whether they can complete that task is dependent on what you've taught them and the language that they have acquired up to this point. Okay. Final piece is number three, the long run, which I don't think, I think we often forget about sometimes, right? What is the long run? Well, when we talk about language learning, at least languages in schools, think about the vast consensus around language learning, at least in my opinion, in the American perspective. What do people often say when it comes to learning languages? Oh, there's so much grammar. Oh, the vocabulary is, it's really hard. There's so many rules and the pronunciation is really hard. There's this real concept that it's like this thing we have to master and not something that we can necessarily go and use. Right. When we change and we shift to a communicative approach, we use this in our classrooms, we can help our students sort of start to break that stereotype. Right. And if we want our students to be advocates for our classes and the languages, especially for you know small departments, people who are the only teacher of that language in their school, we have to have our students be advocates. When our classes are enjoyable for them and they can see the purpose behind what they're doing in class, then that long run is evident. Right. And they will help grow our programs and they'll help advocate for our programs and help them grow. So, like I said, consider the effect that a communicative approach has on our students and how our language programs can benefit. Right. Yeah. Callie, I mean, that's that's really what I'm, I'm hitting at here. Right. The amount of times. Raise your hand in the Zoom chat or actually if you've heard somebody say I took five years of Spanish and I can only say such and such. I took 10 years of French and all I can say is bonjour, merci and we. Oui, right. We hear that all the time and it's like, that's really bad, right? We should be able to do something. Yeah, I mean, the, the replies in the chat, it's it's almost like, I don't want to like, you know, get upset, but it really hurts on the inside when you hear that. You're like, man, all those years learning the language and and that's all you have to say for it. And then they have these, these you know, I just think incorrect opinions about what language learning is like. And a lot of that goes back to just a poor experience that they had in the classroom. So. How then can we do this? Well, the long run is about everything that we do. Our assessments, our warmups, our classroom focuses. And yeah, sorry about that. Um, just what do we focus, right? What is the emphasis in our classroom? What do we do on a daily basis? How do our students perceive our classes? I know often we want to you know, do things as we like to do them, but we have to consider how it impacts our students and what they think of our classes and how that's impacting our signups, right? Our numbers in, in the next years and the following years. So our three reasons, we have a mindset shift, using language for a purpose, and thinking about the long runs, right? That's, that's, the, that's the main why. Now, we shift to how. What are our initial ideas? What do you guys think? How do we go about shifting to a communicative approach? I gave a few examples already with each of those slides. Um, and we'll see a few more coming up, but I want to hear from you all first. How do we shift here? Feel free to share. Jeannie says proper modeling and everyday use of language in the classroom. What do you mean? Can you can you elaborate a little bit, Jeannie? Take the first step on trying, of course. Yes, hi. Sure. Um, so one of the things that I do in my classroom, um, I, from day one, I really do like to emphasize my style of teaching as being, I'm a very simple teacher. Mm -hmm. Like I will teach you, you know, how to use the language. Like, for example, I will say, 
Hola, buenos dias. And I will say their names like every day. Mm -hmm. Every day they walk in and then I'll say, you know, what we're going to be learning today. But it's like the same script, if you will, mm -hmm. so that they kind of have an idea of how to greet somebody mm -hmm. every day. Yep. And so my morning classes, it will always be buenos dias. My afternoon classes will always be buenas tardes. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's how you use the language literally every day in simple yep context yeah i think i think routines routines are, are so I, I think just underappreciated right the value of routines saying the same thing over and over and over right that repetition will be drilled into them that's comprehensible input and they will acquire that language and then they can go and use that language that repetition is so valuable yeah i love love routines what else do we got I think also part of it is having students understand a little bit about the different levels of proficiency so that they know kind of like what you're looking for when you're like, okay, you're level one, you're still a novice. That's why you can't write a whole essay yet. Um, even though like someone said earlier in the chat that they're, you know, their students think they're going to be fluent after one year and then are like, why aren't I yet? Um, just to have the students know a little bit more about like how language is acquired when you're you know, starting from maybe like zero. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think Kelly really hit the nail on the head. I think a lot of a lot of students, you know, they think, oh yeah, four years of Spanish, four years of Chinese, I'll be fluent after four years. You know, like whoa, 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 slow down, slow down. Like like four years of Chinese. I mean, if you're intermediate high at like that's phenomenal. If you can be that high after four years, I don't know what you would what Spanish teachers might say the the Spanish threshold is, but fluent, as we know, is very subjective. And I think students sort of. They conflate four years with 10 hours of class time every single day for four years when it's it can be barely an hour or 50 minutes or whatever long your class periods are. It might not be even every day. So there's a lot that goes into that. So I, I really agree with Callie on, you know, getting your students to realize, you know, see the, the actual ice cream or the pyramid that we've all seen before of this is this is your level right now, right? If you're a novice, you can do these things. If you're intermediate low, you can do these things. If you're advanced low, you can do these things. Can you do these things? Well, then you're there or you're not there. Right? I think one of the things that in my school, I haven't um, put it on the in the classroom, but one of the things that in my school, we we don't really give them a grade. We tell them in which level they are by the end of the year. Mm -hmm. And we, for example, I teach level two. So students by the end of the year need to be exceeding expectations, at least in two categories. Sure. And for them, that would be me being an intermediate low by the end of year two. Uh, however, it's okay to be meeting expectations, which mm -hmm. is for them, that would be novice high. But mm -hmm. we tell them, you because we always tell them, by the end of the year, you need to be at least in one of the categories that we have to evaluate them in intermediate low. Otherwise, when you go to the next level, level three, it's going to be that much more difficult for you because the second semester, that meeting expectation changes. Mm -hmm. You know, the meeting expectations would be intermediate low in the second semester with I am one being exceeding expectations. Mm -hmm. So basically what I do is I show them Okay, your exceeding expectation was novice high at the end of level one. This is what your responses would have looked like at exceeding expectation novice high. This is what it looks like for IL so that they can see the difference between one and the other. Yeah, that's valuable. Thank you, Giselle. I really appreciate that. And a lot of this, a lot of this is 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 just fully revolves around student centered, right? getting our students in the center of what we're doing and having them understand what we're doing, not just we're, you know, leading the class every single day saying, okay, this is what we're doing. This is what we're learning. Getting our students to really understand the learning process. I really like the comment by uh, Martha uh, teaching them about language acquisition versus language learning. Right. Oftentimes I would be like teaching my lessons. I remember like, okay, let's take a step back. We're doing this fancy thing called language acquisition right now. You haven't acquired that term just yet. It will take some time. And, you know, and all go, oh, I see. I see. They don't know that, right? We're, we're <laughs> most of us are, are pretty experienced teachers. We know how this whole thing works. They're kind of just walking in the classroom expecting, you know, snap your fingers. Oh, I can do it, right? Getting them to understand the process can be really, really, really helpful um, when it comes to just, you know, tapering expectations and getting them to see, look, you're not there yet. We'll get there eventually, but it takes time, right? All right, let's look at how do we do this shift to a communicative approach with some samples on extempore as well. Thank you for all of your sharing. That's Really, really great. I love having it be interactive. 
All right, number one, three questions to ask yourself. There'll be a lot of questions on each side, but three main ones to ask yourself, your team, whatever it might be, whoever you are working with. One, is meaning interpretation a central part of input-based materials? Here's what I mean by that. When you assess interpretive, right, listening or reading, and you do assessments or practice, you force your students to make meaning of the target language. It's really important. Here's what I mean by that. You have shared language follow-up questions, you have ranking, sorting, categorizing, some mediation. We'll I'll see examples of all of these coming up. Um, and then what I like to call strong multiple choice questions, which I'll talk about as well. I mentioned here also this, this I dub this the danger zone, right? Where you provide input in the target language, say a sample text, a paragraph, and you have students summarize and answer questions in the target language as well, right? Where you have questions in the target language. I think inherently the idea, the intention is great. You might say, oh, well, we're doing the whole 90% target language thing. It's, it's all in Spanish or it's all in French. It's all in German. The problem here is that you're opening the door to students just parroting that language back to you. And the problem is that you have no idea if you even know, if you know that they know what it means. If you're asking a question in Spanish and they're just pulling you something straight from the text or straight from the audio that they heard, well, then they're just parroting it. They're parroting it back to you. You have no idea if you if they actually know what they mean, if it means, if they know what it means, right? They might, but you don't know that. That's why I advocate these, these shared language. So the shared language of your class, right? English or whatever that might be, wherever you are, including true or false questions, because then they can't just copy language back and they actually have to know, hey, if I'm getting asked a question in English based on a text I read in French, they have to know that what it means in French. Let's see some examples of what I'm talking about here on extempore. Hey, look, extempore. So if you're unfamiliar with extempore, here are some examples of what you can do about it. It's an, it's an assessment platform, all in one, speaking, reading, listening, writing, interpretive, presentational, and interpersonal, all three modes, all four skills, however you want to assess, however you want to practice. This is what I mean by strong multiple choice questions. I've talked about with this with Cali, who's one of our ambassadors, quite a bit. Um, but I really, really like this. I think it's really valuable, right? You have a reading in the target language. This is this was from when Actual was in Boston. I pulled a text straight from Wikipedia, sampled question here. But then the question for this, you have the reading, the student does the reading. The question is, which question cannot be answered based on the text? So in order to answer this question, the student has to answer five questions. That's all in one sort of extemporary question prompt, right? That's a high quality because if you know, if you can tell me, oh, the population of Boston, that's in here. Boston is a popular landmark, that's in here. Does Boston have commuters? That's in here. That's a lot of interpretive skill, a lot. So that's one example of how you can do this. Another one that I really like is something called mediation. This is all input based. The student has to be able to deduce meaning from what they're seeing. A friend of yours saw this sign and wants to know what's being offered. Mediation is where I'm here and I'm a speaker of the target language and I'm helping Bob, who is not a speaker of the target language. And Bob sees this sign. He says, hey, Grant, help me out. Well, I have to mediate. I have to step in and interpret the target language and then put it in a language that he understands. In this case, English. And so I have to look at this sign, say what it means in English, and then that's my interpretation. That's high quality um, interpretive practice and assessment. And this is timed here. It's one thing as well you can do on extempore. So those are some input examples. Let's look at a couple more. More meaning-based assessments in practice. I like to call this odd one out. For, an, for a multiple choice question, you can add audio files, right? So the student has to listen to the four clips and decide which one does not fit in the group. You can't pick the right one if you don't know what they mean, right? You have to be able to deduce and tell me what they mean. Then you can prove to me, hey, yeah, I got this right. I know what these all mean. My interpretive skills are high. Likewise, you can also do one with images here. So I have an audio file of a target language describing one of these places. And then you say, oh, it's this one, this one, this one, or this one. I can't get that right if I don't know what is being said in that picture and then matching that in my head. Well, what's being said in the audio file, excuse me, and then matching that to what is on the, um, in the choices. Lots of chats coming in here to make sure I'm not missing anything. Oh yes, Gisela, great, awesome. Yeah, yeah, Callie is a great ambassador for us. What did she say? They were like, wow, I just have to keep going back and reading because I'm looking for what's in there and boom, exactly. That's what you want, super simple. Question number two for everybody. For output, are students producing language on their own, not parroting, given appropriate scaffolding, perhaps, to complete a task, right? I know I keep mentioning this whole not parroting thing, but it's really, really an issue, right? We want students to produce language that they know on their own, by themselves, right? 
when they do this, there is a reason and a context for why students are producing a language. They have a purpose. Mr. Kastner, why are we doing this today? Well, you know exactly why. We want to talk about the weekend. We want to talk about our favorite foods, right? I mentioned this, though, right? When we add an extra purpose, oftentimes we talk about can-do statements. I can talk about my favorite hobbies. I can order something off of menu. I can do this and that. Way back, a, long P a PD that I attended a long, a long while ago talked about this lesson plan idea. And instead of just having a can-do, you have a reason, a so, right? Talk about your favorite hobbies so your friends can decide what to do at the party. Talk about your favorite classes so somebody can decide what to pick for next year, right? There's always a reason. There's more context to what you're actually doing in the classroom. Another strategy, as we'll see, scaffold everything when it comes to speaking and writing. Just give them the scaffolds. If you want them to say something, give it to them, right? Let them repeat it. Let them read it out loud. That's the target language that we want them to say, right? And assuming this is the big assumption that they have acquired that, that language already via inputs. We give them those scaffolds and then they can produce the language to complete tasks that we want. And then slowly but surely, wean them off of those scaffolds and then they can start to, they can start to do things on their own. Let's see some examples on extempore, shall we? Hey, look, that guy looks familiar. You have a task here, right? Question, little video prompt that the student has to listen to his input and some starter phrases, right? So this is a question about PD. My favorite PD recently was blank. A good PD includes such and such. One thing I learned at Extempore is extravaganza is my biggest takeaway from the past year was such and such, right? So these are really good starter phrases that you can give your students, scaffolded target language starter phrases, um, for them to complete a response, right? There's nothing else here that they can pair it back to you. They talk on their own. They use these starter phrases to just, you know, sort of level up their language, as we like to say. Likewise, not spoken here, but written. A timed message reply with some scaffolds. You give them a text in the target language that they can respond to. And you give them some starter sentences that they can use to respond as well. So far, so good. Any questions? Okay. Oh, maybe. Awesome. Yeah, Giselle, these are really helpful. Final question for you all to consider. Number three, is there an emphasis on connecting the language to the real world? We've talked about this a lot. Communication, we want real world tasks. Think about the five C's. Think about the stories that you tell. Think about authentic resources. Think about real world tasks. That's what we want. Apply the language to the students' lives. Go from small tasks, lowercase t, to big tasks. And then obviously focusing on high frequency vocabulary. Some more questions to think of as you are preparing things when you're looking at different units. What's a relevant target task for this language? What smaller tasks would help students lead, would help lead students to complete the bigger task, the target task? How can students embrace the my language is me concept? I think that's pretty helpful as well. Uh, and then finally, are there opportunities to use the target language beyond the classroom, right? So one that I'm gonna show you coming up is the post-grad life unit, which I only got to teach a few times, but I really enjoyed because students who are in high school and college, many students that we teach, all they hear about is, oh, what are you doing after school? What are you doing after graduation? Where are you going? Like that's always going to be relevant for them, right? And then what are the smaller tasks that we can lead, we can use to help students get to finally do the bigger T target task? You'll see a theme here as we talk about communication. Yeah, Martha, I will be sharing the slides later. Um, the theme of communication is what are we doing with the language? Not what are we learning about the language? What, you know, double object pronouns or noun, noun and adjective agreement. What are we doing with this language? Always thinking about that. Let's see some more examples on extemporary. A weather task. I like this as a summative. It's very straightforward. But again, it's students producing their own language. You could, in theory, of course, add some starter phrases here. I did not, but you could. Look at, look at the forecast, listen to a message from your friend Xiao Wang, and finally respond to him logically using the image and information provided. This is a real world task. This is something we do all the time. Hey, Bob, what do you want to do over the weekend? Let me, let me get back to you and look at the weather first. Something we do all the time. What I like about with extempore is that you can set timers, right? So the student only has a certain time to prepare a response. You can also control how long they have to respond. And this guarantees 
as Dora said way at the beginning, spontaneous response. They're not copying anything. They're not memorizing anything. It's their own language. It's communicative. Hanging with friends, yes. Another task that I like is the post-grad life task. I mentioned this earlier, something that's relevant to all students. At your internship in, in Shanghai, Momo goes to this summer, you really enjoyed your time, so on and so forth. Talk to your supervisor about future goals and what you can do later, right? These are all tasks that we can use with our students that are fully communicative and assess their abilities to use the target language. With, you know, obviously this is not just happening randomly. There's all sorts of CI and other small practice tests leading up to these, but these are high quality assessments um, that you can do as well. We have more tasks. We love tasks. If you don't know, we, we really like tasks here at Extempore. We have our own grab and go task page that you can check out. The link there is below. That'll be with the slides. Um, English, Spanish, French, Arabic, Chinese, simplified, and traditional, and German tasks. There are 50, 17 tasks, I believe, on that page. You can import directly into your account. Uh, very applicable, very relevant for your students that they can do in the target language. We also have something called Extempore Commons, where all of those assessments that you saw me presenting here, um, you can import them directly from our Commons page into your account. You can filter, as you can see, by Spanish. You can filter by formative assessment, summative assessment. Uh, entertainment, family, all of these different variables to find the precise assessment you are looking for. Two of our ambassadors who are thankfully in this presentation, Callie and Dora, have contributed dozens upon dozens of assessments to this. Uh, big claps to them. They have been phenomenal. But they are you know, big contributors, and you can find tons and tons of tasks in, I know, Spanish, French, German, Chinese, and a couple of languages as well um, for your classes directly on Extempore right here, all for free. Let's recap, shall we? What did we learn? Let's talk, if my slides come up. What is community language teaching? Why should we shift to this type of approach? And how do we make this shift happen? Tell me, reflect, unmute, turn off your camera, put a message in the chat. What do you think? I think the biggest reason is because it's going to be more practical mm -hmm. and they're going to use it more often because yeah. it's things that are relevant to them, things they do every day. So if we can just get them weaned off of the English into the target language, yay, you did it. I, yes, and They can do it again and again and again. Yeah. <laughs> so that's probably the biggest uh, plus of doing that because I have a lot of students that have said, you know, oh, I, I need to remember this. And I'm like, yeah, that's the idea. You have to remember things because <laughs> you're going to use them over and over again. Absolutely. Thanks, Melanie. You're welcome. Others, please feel free to share. May says, make the language part of the real world as John Dewey said himself to bring the language, bring the learning to life. Did not expect to see John Dewey's name today, but great. That's awesome. Keeping the questions you shared with us constant in our minds. What are we doing with the language? Yes, Sophia, right? As your principal walks into your room. What are you doing today? Right? What are you doing in class today? We're helping people plan for the weekend. We're picking out the best classes at our school. Yeah, we want them to be able to use it in the real world. Any other thoughts? How do we um, make this happen? Well, we want to be able to have when the students are communicating and they're not focusing like, oh, did I just like put the correct adjective mm -hmm. or you know, did I just use the correct verb form? And hopefully they're thinking more of like, how well was I understood? And did I meet the goal of what I was asking someone or yeah. what it was asking me to do? And so, you know, by using things like comprehensible input, like you mentioned, and making the small tasks to the big task, um, you know, when you get to the assessment, hopefully it feels familiar and they're not like, I never answered a type of question like this before, whereas they're actually like, hey, we did something like this two days ago. And you're like, well, yeah, that was all practice for yeah. this. Yeah, the, the little T task should be practice for the big task, right? It should all be very familiar with that for, with them by the end of that lesson and the end of that unit, really, when you go to assess. Yeah, these are great reasons. I, I think, oh, Kelly, just slipped my mind. Um, yeah, giving them purpose, right? de-emphasizing the need for grammar and proper, you know, uh, language. I don't, again, to, to, to reiterate, it's not that you can't, and it's not that you shouldn't. It's just that there are sort of downsides when you emphasize it too much and it becomes way too much of a central feature, right? You can definitely teach conjugation. You can definitely teach proper, you know, noun and adjective agreement. 
it's just a matter of what we emphasize and how we, um, you know, how we go about doing this in our classes. Jason says, CLT is learning about one another, other cultures and content, constant flow of messages, information, opinions, plans, gossip even. Absolutely, right? Spill the tea. Use the target language and tell me what's going on, my friends. It's great, right? Because they're using the target language. If it doesn't matter to me, like, if you're using it, you're doing something with it, I've done something right, right? But we can't do that unless we use this communicative approach. All right, last thing. May says it's important to help students work together to speak the language and then help them through assignments to connect to the new gener to the new generation world. Yeah, these are great. Okay. Yes, hey, there's this thing called extempore if you haven't seen so far, and it's very much related and tied to communicative language teaching. What can you do with it? As I mentioned, all in one practice and assessment platform, all four skills, all three modes, all in one place. You can do spontaneous responses with timers. I didn't get, a, get into that a whole lot today. I mentioned it briefly, but when you add those timers, you guarantee a communicative, a communicative, a spontaneous, hopefully communicative response from your students, which is really valuable. We have our task database as well as more in the Commons library, which I showed earlier. There are also benefits, not just to you, but to your students as well, which I think a lot of our users can attest. You can build confidence and comfort. Right? When you do responses, especially audio responses on your own in the privacy of your own home or wherever you want to speak, nobody's judging you right? and you are slowly building their confidence to use the target language um, and complete tasks. Like I said, use the language. That's not clear today. Well, hopefully it is. Thank you all so much for attending. That is all I have for the rest of today. We have tons of resources on YouTube, Facebook, and whatever else they're calling that bird logo, which I, man, I put that like a week ago, and now it's irrelevant. At Extempore App, you can find us there. You can also join our Facebook group run by the lovely Callie Rump in here. And we have a bunch of teacher testimonials. If you're curious about why you should use Extempore, uh, well, let the teachers tell it for you on our YouTube channel. You can go there. There are teacher features, quite a few already. Um, with more to come. Hear it from them. Don't hear it from me. And you can hopefully learn all about what we do at Extempore. Again, thank you all so much for coming. Sandra Savignon, 1987. And of course, our feedback form. Please, please take the time to fill out the feedback form if you can. I will put the link in the, in the what? In the chat. And you can go from there or scan the QR code directly. We need feedback. Thank you, Thomas. Yeah, Thomas, just share the slides. Appreciate it. Any questions? Oh, thank you all so much. I believe I posted the slides. Yeah. Thank you, Thomas, for sharing the slides. They should be right there. I'll add them to Sketch very shortly. Um, they'll be there, and you can find them there again. Thank you, everyone, so much for attending. I really appreciate it. Happy to answer any questions that you might have. <laughs>